so hi. I'm super excited to be here. I've never been in Estonia before. It's my first time. And um, I've been looking forward uh, to, to this and to do this speech. As um, was just told, my name is Albertina Spahult. I have worked in the games industry for several years. I've worked several different games companies as designer and uh, production manager. And I've also worked in game design. But now I am the head of secretariat for this initiative. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, how it started, uh, why, and what we actually do. If you have questions, uh, feel free to, to ask them after the presentation. Uh, you're very, very welcome to do that. So um, let's start with some kind of overview for you guys. So uh, Diversity is a nonprofit organization, first of all. Um, it's based on volunteer work. And um, it's, um, we define it as a collective force for greater diversity within the games industry. Not only the industry, it's about enabling people from the industry, educational institutions, and communities to um, support and encourage each other's diversity efforts. Um, a clarification as well. Uh, when we talk about diversity, we do it from a pretty wide angle. Um, as was mentioned, the, the games industry is uh, dominated by males, but it's not only about that. It's also about language, for example. There are a lot of language barriers, and uh, the industry is also dominated by the English-speaking countries, uh, making games in Arabic, for example, it's not that easy uh, because of uh, the tools and software and such. Um, we usually talk about diversity um, in these terms, uh, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, physical and cognitive impairments, body image, and also age. I still want to be able to play World of Warcraft when I'm, when I'm 90 years old, of course. Um, so a little bit about the background. How did it all start? Uh, 2013, there was a pre-project financed by Vinova, which is the Swedish innovation agency. And uh, they got this mission where they did a surrounding world analysis to identify needs when it comes to diversity within the Swedish games industry. What they found was a couple of different things. Uh, for one, that initiatives connected to diversity already existed, but they were very spread out. It was hard for them to have a long-lasting communication in between each other, which sort of led to them reinventing the wheel over and over again. It was hard to get a feel for what kind of progress they were making. And um, the lack of a mutual gathering point led to hampered and slow progress. Um, another um, thing about these initiatives that did exist and, and still do was that they usually focus on only one aspect of the gaming sphere. It focused maybe on the gaming community, on the industry, or on education. And um, we found that all of these are interconnected very closely. Um, when you talk about community and industry, it's also pretty natural to start to talk about community management. And in fact, the people that work as community managers are often at the forefront of moderating, approaching the community, handling questions around diversity that might come up, and etc. So this is how the idea of making an umbrella organization came up. And... Uh, that's when diversity was conceptualized. Yeah. So what about purpose and need? Um, I can tell you a story about myself. I've been going to conferences, and in particular, the GDC, GDC in San Francisco and GDC Europe for several years. Um, I went to my first conference maybe eight or nine years ago. It was then held in Leipzig in Germany. It was called the GZDC. And um, I went there with a couple of friends who were also female. And uh, 
I remember very, very clearly the first time I sort of ventured out into the conference area and I found myself surrounded by a sea of men. I don't have anything against men, by the way. I like dudes. But uh, <laughs> it was still a bit, of, a bit of a strange feeling. And I found myself looking for the bathroom. And I went to the bathroom. And uh, it looked like this. <laughs> this was a very, very common sight at conferences like eight years ago. And you know, I thought to myself, sweet, no cue. I'm just going to glide past all these people and go to the bathroom. And I thought to myself, this might be the one pro of <laughs> being the only woman here. Now, I went to the GDC, I just came back from San Francisco, and um, there was a really long line to the <laughs> women's bathroom. And every single woman in this queue was talking about how amazing it was to stand in line for the bathroom, what amazing progress we've done <laughs> that I have to queue <laughs> to get to the bathroom. This is a true story. If you Google this online, you're going to find a lot of stories about it. So, I mean, some things have a tendency to speak for themselves, yeah? I don't have to put everything into words. Any days. Anyways. <clears throat> When it comes to the industry, uh, research states that the industry needs diversity to keep on growing. They need a broadened pool of talent in order to keep making unique game ideas and keep being innovative. There's only so long you can keep regurgitating the same content over and over. They also need to be able to keep up with its customers, which are changing and growing. Uh, there's a lot of things that come up when we approach companies um, and uh, a lot of the time they talk about recruitment and the difficulties that they face surrounding that and um, of course they want to be able to pick from a, a broad pool of talent um, and not have to be selective from a very small homogeneous group. The educations need a way to address this. They're bringing up the game developers of tomorrow, and sometimes it's about culture. You are taught early if technology is aimed towards you or not. Um, we have several projects with young girls coding, for example. Um, one project called Sheihak, which has become really, really big. And then when it comes to gamers, I think that in general, it's good to create a gathering point for them as well. This is Pac Manhattan, by the way. This is a, a live uh, action, <laughs> uh, virtual reality, no, not virtual reality, um, an ARG. Uh, you can see what it is. They're chasing this per person. It requires a lot of stamina. Anyways, um, so what we do in terms of community, for example, maybe you can crowdsource and help people with moderation if they want to go on Twitch. Because if you stick out, if you belong to the LGBT community or if you are a young woman, for example, one of the main things that keep you from going out on Twitch is actually uh, community management and moderation on the channels because it can be very, very tough um, and very, very detrimental. And we do stuff like that. Uh, Stockholm eSports are really good at doing this kind of stuff. Um, all right. Um, so in practice, what we do how does it all come together? I'd like to point out also that when we talk about diversity, we do so both in a quantitative and qualitative way. And you might ask yourself, what is the difference? I can see some frowns in the audience. So when we talk about this, um, when we talk about quantity, usually this is about representation. Maybe you look at a company and you see that, oh, there's only one black guy working here. Or maybe it would be nice to have a sort of 50-50 or 60-40 representation of men and women. Maybe that would be nice. That's about quantity. When it comes to quality, we're talking more about education and knowledge. So you might actually have a company that's got, you know, 80% men and 20% women or 2% women or whatever working there. But they might have a philosophy still that promotes equality. They might have a plan for how to handle sexual harassment at work, for example. Um, so quality doesn't always come with quantity and the other way around, right? Uh, so we like to work with both. 
we try to create platforms for cooperation. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about that soon. And we are also trying to provide practical tools so that you actually can go home and <laughs> or go to work and try to apply these tools to what you do and the people around you. When it comes to structure, and this might be a little bit boring, but the reason I talk about this as well is that we see the Swedish diversity as, um, as a pilot, almost. We see this as a format that can be exported pretty easily abroad. Um, and um, it's something that we are starting just now uh, doing. It's trickling out into the rest of Scandinavia, also to Europe, and somewhat to the States as well. Um, we have a board uh, where all three sectors are represented, and they have like a visionary responsibility. We have uh, operations, which I am the boss of. And um, it handles the practical day-to-day -day running of the organization. It also handles national projects and events that we do. We have local groups or chapters that are based all around in Sweden, uh, Malmö, Stockholm, Gothenburg, Visby, and so on. And then all of this includes the network and the plan is to have a membership that you can join online, which opens up for anybody anywhere in the world to join either as a private person or as an organization. So when it comes to operations, um, we do a lot of coordination between the local groups and make sure things work with them. Uh, we also pick up a lot of ideas that they have locally, but they might not be able to go through with because it requires too much money or a national effort, for example. <coughs> um, and we also manage the tools. Um, a lot of the projects that we work on are focused on this. We work with um, conferences, for example, talk about um, the speakers list that they have maybe or how they approach diversity. They ask us for advice. Um, we help companies develop a recruitment plan to reach a wider pool of people. Often companies come to us and say, hey, we would really like to recruit so-and-so, but they're not applying. What should we be doing about this? And then we give them suggestions. We also work with uh, code of conduct and advice. This is a project that we just ran. Um, we were working together with King, which is a big Swedish game developer. And uh, they are very, very smart because they want to recruit and they want to recruit more women into their company. So they come to us and say, let's make this project. And we say, well, this is what we suggest. Let's bring um, 10 women from all over Europe to the GDC and um, let them network, and um, let's make it a competition. So we did this, we started in September uh, last year. We got a huge amount of applicants to this competition, which means that King now is sitting with maybe, you know, a list of formidable CVs from young women all over the industry. The majority of them are coders, by the way, of several hundred. They all have established a contact with them. They can poke them about internships and etc. And also, we get to bring um, 10 of them to the GDC so that they can enjoy whatever that has to offer. The reason that we chose to focus on women for this, because diversity is not only about women in games, this is very important, um, is partly because it's also easy to, th there are more um, statistics um, available regarding women in games, which also legally makes it easier um, to, to take 10 women to, um, to the GDC. But it could also be um, other minority or underrepresented groups. Here are some pictures from that. They were really excited. Our chairperson also was part of a uh, talk at the GC called Ripple Effect, How Women in Games Initiative Make a Difference. And you can find that on GDC Vault if you're curious. Her name is Gemma. She is a transgender person. Um, here are some uh, pictures from our panel. And what is interesting about this is that 
we ask a lot of people to join us for these panels. This is a private session together with the women. And um, from the, the right to left, you can see Anders, uh, who is a senior software engineer at Blizzard. Michelle Koch, who is the creative director for Life is Strange. You have Carolyn Krenzer, who is head of studio at King. You have Rami Ismail, who is uh, the indie developer from Van Beer. Liz England, uh, Jane NG from Firewatch, she's the lead environmental um, artist there. You also have Brie Code, who was the producer for Child of Light. I don't know if you know any of these games, but um, there's some pretty interesting titles. And what happens is that they want to come because they believe in the topic. They get to share their experience with a new generation, but they also get to discuss together with themselves. So you can hit several points where you create opportunities for, co for cooperation and giving people a chance to talk about the topics that they find are important surrounding diversity. This is another thing that we did, or actually, we shouldn't take the credit for this. There are several organizations involved in this. Uh, we were part of making a Swedish eSports code of conduct. I think it, it exists both in Swedish and English. You can download it online, which is like a code of conduct recommendation um, for hosts of gaming events. DreamHack has been a huge part of developing this. So they are also part in the advisory group that has uh, taken this uh, and realized it. Again, really good stuff. I do recommend that you check it out. This is also part of uh, the national uh, level projects that we involve ourselves in. We also have a podcast uh, digging into various topics. You can see some of them here. Sexuality in games. Ableism, 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 and gaming with disabilities, ethnicity in games, queer sexuality in games. All these episodes are available on our website too, and it's completely free. You can check them out in the iTunes store. Um, another example of the kind of projects that we do. And all of this comes from the people, the volunteers, or people in the companies that join us and come up with their ideas, and together we decide what we don't want to do within our region. This is the Nordic Game uh, Conference last year, where we also had like an event a panel. Um, this is from an esports event this summer, together with Stockholm Esports in their project Respect All Compete, um, where we had a tournament with esports stars, and also talked about diversity. Um, so there's a lot of initiatives going on in Sweden, and I can see practically that we can do even more stuff because we work together so and also lots of really interesting and fun ideas that come to life because we've actually chosen to work together so it's something that i can highly recommend i've met such amazing and interesting people doing this um then we also have our website and um it looks like this <laughs> you can't actually see the address here um you can see some of the companies that support us, most of them are Swedish at the moment, but as you can see, we've got both indie companies and some pretty big names behind us uh, that are in interested in partaking in this, and um, there's a huge level of excitement and engagement for these questions. Um, and um, the idea for the website is to take it one step further, where you become a member, log in, and get access to tools that we are working on. Some of them are already available. Um, but where you, for example, can establish contacts with other organizations or find partners for your projects, but also find lists. For example, maybe you are um, hosting a conference and you're looking to diversify it. Then you can log in here and actually see a list of very, very diverse speakers that are also professionals within the industry that would probably love to come to your event. Um, Another thing that you can see are lists of papers, articles, also statistics. A lot of people come to me and say, hey, so this looks interesting and important, but I don't know. Um, I would like to see some numbers and what are the actual benefits of diversity and how will it help my company? Is there any profit in it? Or is this actually true? Or when somebody approaches me about this, you know, I wish I could have an answer for them. And I'm not sure how to formulate myself. Um, then 
having statistics and links to access for knowledge um, it can also be very, very useful. And I think in general, when it comes to quality and quality diversity, it's about raising the bar for where we can have a discussion about this. Um, and that only comes with increased knowledge. Um, website, we have a Twitter, you should go there, you should <laughs> follow us. <laughs> Uh, we have a Facebook page as well that you can check out. It's called Diversity Sweden, uh, and we're about to make a global one as well. So if you follow this one, you keep an eye out for the next level, so to speak. Um, I'm almost done. A little bit about our local groups. Uh, you can see them here in action. And um, one thing that I really like about the local groups is, for one, you can see the needs that exist in a specific region. Because sure, there might be some problems that are general, but some regions might have a bigger interest in some areas, and then they're free to focus on what they want and what they find important within their region. Um, so it's about addressing local needs. It also provides us with a really important and um, more factual picture of what needs are actually there, and it keeps us up to date because we can see what the local groups are discussing, what ideas they're bringing up, what questions they have, and we can try to accommodate that and bring that up. Um, they also provide us with ideas, some things they might not be able to do on a local level, as I said before, and then they bring it up uh, to the national um, organization and we can take it further. <coughs> So, all in all, spread the word. Feel free to join. Feel free to check out the website. You can email me. Um, you can use this contact email down there if you have questions. Um, and um, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Albertina. And let's hope for longer queues for the women toilet at yes. GBC. <laughs> Um, any questions from the audience? Yes. Has there been some negative feedback or backlashes against all of this for like from companies or individuals? Very little. Um, none from companies in Sweden. Um, some companies are a bit more hesitant, especially when we talk to companies uh, abroad. But they're usually not, it's not like negative feedback, it's more like, okay, some hesitation, but we would like to know more. And then we have a talk about it, and they talk about how they see things, and we listen, and we bring our perspective into it. Uh, when we went to GDC, and our, uh, our chairperson went on a panel, she was on a panel with Zoe Quinn, and the entire panel was uh, threatened, and uh, they had to take in security and have police patrolling the area because uh, there had been uh, death threats towards the panel. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but not, um, I think that's a lot because of the various names on that panel specifically. Um, but in general, very, very little actually, very little. Um, anyone else? So you talked about uh, how uh, companies should diversify their uh, employees, like from um, different, um, uh, like what kind of groups they represent. Mm -hmm. And you talked about how uh, women should be more brought in into into developing games, into being a part of co a company. Mm -hmm. So um, and it kind of sounded to me like a quota, like you have to have 50% of women and 50% of men, mm -hmm. and. Um, doesn't that bring like kind of if somehow it happens that uh, in that region for that company uh, mm -hmm. applying uh, there are applying different people, and most of them uh, most um, competent competent of them somehow happen to be men, but the company says no, we have a policy that we ha need to have 50% women, so I'm sorry it's it's not your fault like you have a really good CV but we have to turn you away. Isn't that like doing the 
opposite thing, like discriminating against men? It is a great question, and it's the most common question I get when I get to it. It's always asked on every talk, so thank you for filling this role and bringing it up. Um, this is partly the reason for why we talk about the difference between quantity and quality. Quantity and numbers and quotas doesn't necessarily lead to quality, right, in terms of diversity. So. Um, the, the, easy, the easiest answer is that, <laughs> no, <laughs> this generally doesn't happen because um, usually there are so, so, so few that apply and um, the companies, they don't, like their frustration is finding the competence. Like they wanna find the competence. Maybe there are only two applying, uh, two women out of 10 and they maybe don't have the competence, and then they can't employ them. So the question for them, I think, is more like, how do we reach the competence? And you know, if 10 of them or 20 that applied were women, then it's really likely that we would find somebody there that also were really competent and a great fit for a company. So I think they see it more as increasing the numbers earlier. Uh, looking at studies and such, for example, and the kind of prejudices that exist there. I also think you need to be aware of that <coughs> in a sphere that is fairly male-dominated um, or female-dominated, it's very, very easy to already be biased. So you have a lot of cases of unconscious bias. This is very thoroughly documented uh, scientifically as well. For example, with musicians where you have <laughs> musicians play and you see the person and the recruitment result is one and when they play from behind the screen and they don't see who is playing they just listen to the music the recruitment result is different so i think you need to be aware that it, there is already a bias going on um where we sort of have a bigger trust in men to be competent within technical areas and i think it's a bit dangerous to to ignore that so i would say maybe it really depends on the company and the size of the company. For, for really small companies, it can be really, really hard um, to strive for a 50-50 quota, and they might not be able to afford that, which is completely acceptable and okay. But I think it's more about working with quality then within your company and see, well, uh, what does our ad looks like? Are our ads formulated in a certain way that attract a certain group of people? How do we ourselves think about these things? And I think studies in general say that once you work with your own unconscious bias, then the rest follows pretty naturally. We are running out of time and the panel okay. is, is waiting. All so right, there's a panel right up there. Any more questions? No, no, no. Any more questions can be more personal. <laughs> No more questions? No more questions. Oh, okay. To. I was told that the questions should be after, so I yeah, that's yeah. why I didn't, yeah. All right, but you can poke me outside, and yeah. you uh, in particular. Thank you, Albertina. Yeah, thank you. That we have you here.